Hi and welcome to this panel discussion on open science during the Open Access Week, hosted by the University Libraries in the Stockholm Trio University Alliance. I am Göran Hamrin, and before we welcome our panelists, I will give some housekeeping rules. Please use the Q&A function in your Zoom client to ask questions during the discussion, and we will try to make room at the end for them. Note that the panel session is recorded and the recording is now in progress. Our panel today consists of three prominent researchers. We welcome Gustav Nilssonne, Associate Professor of Neuroscience, Karolinska Institutet, Coordinator of Data Domain Specialists in the Swedish National Data Service Consortium. Nilssonne is a long-standing advocate for open science and is involved in numerous initiatives in Sweden and internationally to promote open access and other aspects of open science, including Open Science Community Sweden and the European Open Science Cloud Association. Welcome, Gustav. We also, wel we also welcome Terence Brown, Professor of Technology-Based Entrepreneurship at the Department of Industrial Economics and Organization, KTH Royal Institute of Technology. He is a writer, researcher, consultant, entrepreneur, and lecturer on creating value. He is the founding editor of the International Journal of Entrepreneurial Venturing and has an interest and experience in academic publishing. Welcome, Terence. Thank you for having me. We also welcome Paula Oymanen, Professor of Social Social Anthropology, Stockholm University. Committed to the open sharing of scholarly work, Paula is the chair of the editorial board for Anthropology and Society, a peer-reviewed series of academic monographs and edited volumes published in open access by Stockholm University Press. She is also on the editorial committee for Kritisk Ethnography, Swedish Journal of Anthropology, an open access journal published by the Swedish Society for Anthropology and Geography. Welcome, Paula. As a start, I would like our panel to reflect on the topic of open science and the theme of this open access week. It matters how we open knowledge, building structural equity. Could you please each in turn give your views if open science is a way to improve equity and build a bridge between different communities, in particular between the global south and the global north. And my random generator, has elected that Paula, followed by Gustav, followed by Terence, will be the order to respond. Paula, please. For that question, I'm I'm focusing on open access only in terms of open access publication rather than open science at large, which is a much bigger issue. And when it comes to open access, uh, if you look at it from a global perspective, I, I think it's uh, very, very pertinent, uh, not only to, uh, as you've mentioned, building bridges between the global south and the global north, but also for a more important thing to break down barriers. Uh, if we're going to take the decolonization of uh, scientific knowledge production to heart, I think open access is one of the you know, key aspects of that whole process. Because as we know that a great deal of scientific knowledge production is today dominated by the Western world. It's also where all the uh, kind of eminent publications are located, uh, which means that scholars publish in whether it's articles or monographs that are not open access. Uh, they, they publish their works to a very, very limited readership, and thereby also excluding a lot of researchers, uh, let alone you know, others who might be interested in their results. So to break down this barrier, I think open access is very important so that people or scholars around the world get to take part of the knowledge production that's taking place, no matter where it is. And here, I think it's uh, not a, a question of Western scientists, if you forgive my generalization, to open up their knowledge production and sharing that, but also to make sure that uh, researchers around the world, especially in Global South, are also included uh, in this knowledge production and given access to open access publication. I'll start with that. 
Thank you. Uh, Gustav, please. Thank you. Yes, um, I do believe that uh, knowledge is a public good and the equitable access to knowledge is a human right. And um, as uh, we are well aware, the current uh, models in which we publish science uh, involve uh, researchers sending manuscripts to uh, journals operated by publishing houses that uh, require uh, subscription agreements in order for uh, readers to access the articles. Uh, this creates a major inequity where uh, researchers in well-resourced countries uh, have far better access, but also a whole layer of inequities between different groups of people, uh, for instance, practitioners outside of the universities uh, have a hard time accessing uh, research outputs. This may include, uh, for example, medical professionals, innovators in the private sector, uh, and so on. Uh, when we try to open up uh, this, uh, this access, uh, it matters how we do it, I do strongly believe. And uh, in particular, the, uh, the model where authors pay up front, sometimes known as gold open access, introduces a whole new set of inequities, uh, making it difficult for under-resourced researchers uh, to contribute their works into uh, the canonized literature. Uh, although many, uh, many publishers have uh, exemptions for under-resourced authors, uh, I believe we need a system that uh, that works uh, regardless of uh, of this kind of uh, 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 this kind of fixes uh, for uh, for certain minority populations. I believe we, as a scientific community, need to take control of our infrastructure, and that the ultimate goal should be to replace the uh, the current scientific journals with infrastructures where the scientific community can control the publishing and the quality control mechanisms, the evaluation mechanisms uh, that we have for the scientific outputs. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Gustav. Terence, please. Yes, hi. First, I'm, I'm coming from a, uh, the perspective of a researcher in uh, open uh, innovation, uh, open business models, uh, open data, and also open access. As was said, open science is a a little bit uh, higher level uh, concept, and I haven't given too much thought on that, but maybe uh, today is the uh, is the day. Uh, I would I would disagree and say that uh, that knowledge is not a public good. Uh, it's easy to make it a public good, but I don't think it necessarily is a public good. And I think in part that's where some of the uh, the challenges and debates uh, uh, exist. Um, I think that uh, especially in uh, in looking at uh, the the ownership issue, uh, it, it it is often a uh, a question of the haves versus the have-nots, and I'm certainly in favor of uh, the de democratization of uh, of knowledge uh, and, and access. Um, but again, it's not just the the knowledge and access that's important; it's how you use uh, and the processes you use to put that knowledge uh, to good uh, to good uh, uh, to good work. Uh, one can say. So I'm, I'm very much looking forward uh, to discussing uh, these issues uh, related to, uh, to open access and, and whatnot. And they're, 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 their paradigm is, uh, is, is maybe changing. We can't really tell. We have to look in retrospect for that. Uh, but, uh, but let's get into it. Thank you, Terence, for those insights. Yes, can science be considered as a public good or not? Uh, would any of the panelists like to give some immediate response? Well, perhaps uh, Terence, you and I are in agreement uh, after all. Uh, the statement that knowledge is a public good as far as I'm concerned is aspirational and uh, intended to, uh, uh, to lead to the question, why do we continue putting our outputs behind paywalls? Yeah, when you, the, the issue is, um, is in, in all things, you're going to have a, uh, 
a, a balance, an imbalance of power between the, the haves and the have nots. And, uh, and there are pros and cons to, uh, for, the, for the haves to, to, uh, uh, to open and share their, their data, but they tend to focus on, on, on the cons. Um, I would say that um, uh, you have a challenge with getting those folks that are doing the funding of the research uh, to continue to put forth effort and funds to do research if they can't uh, commercially benefit uh, upfront. Uh, there's certainly uh, secondary and tertiary effects of, uh, of their activity uh, and some of those affect society uh, uh, directly and in, in great sort of ways. But I think that those that are uh, the private, private uh, uh, firms that are investing in, in knowledge do want to see some sort of uh, return. So you need to really make the case to them that opening the data is going to benefit them as well as, uh, as others. And in my research in, in open innovation, uh, we have some of those, uh, um, those cases whereby firms who have opened up uh, and shared their research have benefited greatly by doing so. And so you need more cases, uh, more cases like that. It's, uh, you know, it's preaching to the choir is one thing, but you really have to preach to the, <laughs> to the other side. And so to do that, uh, you need to make a, a case. And, and for private industry, you may need to make a case that's uh, financially based. Yeah, thank you, Terence. Uh, raising the question of open innovation and uh, uh, good cases showing uh, that open science uh, is a benefit. But uh, moving on, I would like to raise some common objections towards open science because it has been said that requirement from, for example, research funders on uh, researchers that they should openly publish their results, for example, their research data or source code, that that is a restriction and that it both limits the efficiency of research and the intellectual freedom of the individual researchers. And it has been claimed that giving people outside academia access to research results does not improve the research process or the societal impact. What are your views on that? And this time would Gustav, followed by Terence, followed by Paula, respond, please. Yes, I, I appreciate these um, uh, arguments. I believe if, uh, as some have suggested, uh, researchers ought to be mandated to publish their outputs in a particular venue, that would be a considerable infringement on academic freedom. For example, if a funder said that everything you do funded by our money has to be published in our uh, journal, uh, I believe that would be a, a rather strong restriction on, uh, on researchers' academic freedom. Uh, what I do believe is sensible is for funders to uh, require that outputs be made uh, openly available uh, in a manner that the researcher can choose according to uh, guidance or criteria. Uh, we do see some funders building their own publication platforms, for example, uh, the European Commission, the Wellcome Trust, uh, where uh, their grant holders can be recommended to publish. I think this may be one way forward, uh, while not exclusively, exclusively requiring it. Uh, one particular thing I think uh, the funders can do is to facilitate this change by working to uh, modernize uh, the way uh, scientific merits are assessed. So to decouple the, the scientific merits from the prestige of journals. I think this is uh, perhaps the main factor that, that ties us uh, to the, uh, the current system where, uh, where the journal article is the, uh, the currency of, of uh, of achievement and of, of merit for researchers. This makes it very difficult uh, to make a transition to a more open uh, scientific uh, uh, culture. Thank you, Gustav. Terence, any comments? Yeah, I'm, I'm 
generally against uh, mandates. So uh, Gustav's uh, suggestion of encouraging um, the publication of research, I think, is is the way to go. And you need to make a case. I mean, research answers some of the questions. Okay, if you make the case that if you open it up, you can answer more of those questions. I think that that's a reason. Uh, a reasonable person, a reasonable researcher would uh, would go for. I think that uh, in uh, what's happening in uh, in management and in some of the social sciences in terms of uh, in terms of uh, research, and they're not asking for the source code per se, but what they're requiring you to do is upload your data to the journals. And, uh, and that's a little tricky. It's a little tricky for the funders. It's a little, you know, it's a little scary for those that have created the data. Um, uh, but the reason isn't for openness. Uh, the, the case is for uh, uh, falsifying data and, 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 and doing uh, 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 unethical uh, research. And so by uploading it, the idea is that they'll have uh, uh, a, a check on it, but uh, but once the data is there, it does um, it does lead to the idea of if it's there, then maybe we should uh, give other people a crack at it to see if they come up with the same results that you do, and then we're going down a, a path where uh, uh, where data is is more is more open, and and I, and I think that uh, that that is happening, but we have a a certain publishing paradigm in management, and uh, there's a competing one that's trying to break through. And it's it's possible to have multiple business models in publishing, uh, but uh, usually one will be uh, dominant. And right now, we're still in the the the, uh, the current one. Uh, whether or not we go open access, we can talk about later on uh, today. Thank you, Terence. Uh, Paula, any comments? Yeah, and I, th I think uh, it's it's important to keep in mind that science comes in many different forms. Uh, I, th I think, uh, for instance, in and, and that's why I'm focusing on open access publications rather than open science, because if you start talking about open data, for instance, it becomes extremely problematic in my discipline, which is social anthropology. We have we have very strong ethical guidelines because we work with people. Our, our data comes from talking to people, from hanging out with people, and we, we get a lot of sometimes very, very sensitive information about people. And we have a duty to respect the integrity and anonymity of those people and to do no harm. So for us, open data doesn't work. I, I, I recently just got from the university, there's some new requirement that we have to give some of our uh, research related data supposed to be archived at Stockholm University. And, and I mean, it's like, there, there's no way I can share, for instance, like, you know, the content of my interviews in an archive at Stockholm University, because that would be going against our ethical guidelines, which are there for a good reason. So that's why I say op open data and all that. There, I see benefits, but also some serious issues that cannot always be applied. Now, for open for open access publication, on the other hand, uh, I, I don't think it's necessary like to to tear down the current infrastructure of publishing. Um, it's about finding ways forward to work together. And, and here the, the, the haves and have nots, as Terence put it, in my field becomes really problematic. Uh, so I'm an anthropologist. I, I, do, I work a lot in, in Tanzania, for instance. So whatever I publish is based on, you know, stories I gather in Tanzania and somewhere it should belong to them as well. But if I insist on publishing without caring for open access, that knowledge is then published in, a, in, a, in, in publications that they can't even access. Uh, and that's where the injustice comes in. And I can give a recent example. My co-researcher in Tanzania recently emailed to me and he's preparing his PhD kind of proposal concept note. And he had found a lot of really interesting articles in Google Scholar, but a lot of them he could not access because they were not published in open access. So, and that, that's just a, a very concrete example of someone who is excluded from scholarship, 
Whereas me sitting, as Gustav pointed out, you know, we sit on resources, of course, through Stockholm University, I could access most of those articles for him and obviously send them to him. Interesting responses indeed from you all. And instead of me responding, would you like to comment or raise an objection to anything said here? So uh, what Terence said about open data to me highlights the intimate connection between open science and trustworthy science. When the data are there, a reader, a third party can verify that the data exists and can uh, challenge the analytical assumptions made by the authors by reanalyzing the data to see if the same results can be obtained and uh, possibly improve on the, on the analytical methods uh, to see uh, uh, if more can be learned. Uh, there have been some notable examples, not least during the pandemic, of high profile papers where the data turned out not to exist. Uh, papers that did change practice in some cases. There was the Surgisphere scandal, for example, where a researcher claimed to have access to large registry data. Now, in medicine as well, uh, it's uh, uh, not possible to publish uh, identifiable uh, data uh, on humans and, and their health outcomes uh, for the ethical reasons that Paula uh, alluded to. Nevertheless, we can have mechanisms to share anonymized data uh, and also mechanisms by which data can be vouched for by a third party in some cases. Uh, there is a great need, uh, I think, for clarifying the legal basis for uh, data sharing using different means like this within the European Union at present. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree I agree with virtually everything that you that you said. My only issue has to do I mean we, we're in a competitive uh, world and uh, let alone business competition and academics are also competitive uh, as well. And if I use my creativity and innovativeness and whatnot and develop research questions and then collect the data and whatnot and then, uh, you're able to, to take that data and verify, which is fine, but as you say, improve on it, that reduces my, my incentive to be creative and innovative and work hard to collect the data because then you can just piggyback on someone else's work. Now, I think that's, that's, that's a problem. It's, it's maybe not insurmountable, but it's a problem. I certainly agree it's a problem. And what it suggests to me is that the incentives are misaligned. Uh, researchers are getting credit for a publication and not for sharing the data set, which may be a more important scientific contribution. Uh, I would favor looking for ways to, to realign the incentives so that a researcher, for example, if I were to apply for a job or a grant, uh, I would list my scientific outputs, including uh, things like data, code, materials, uh, and not just papers. This, I think, would also allow a wider diversification of, uh, of roles, ways to be a scientist. Uh, I, I could see a future where some scientists could specialize in data generation, curation, and sharing, for example. Uh, instead of having scientists being synonymous with being an author, which is to some extent the case today, you have to write science to be a scientist, and if you do author scientific publications, then you are a scientist in some sense. Yes, you have been zooming in on open data, and of course, it's easy to say uh, as open as possible, as close as necessary. And uh, some one of you have highlighted the need for uh, clarifications in the sort of legal gray zones that exist. But you're also talking about uh, the scientific merit system, uh, as you said, mentioned, Gustav. And you said something about the decoupling of uh, scientific prestige or scientific uh, career uh, uh, from the prestigious journals. And uh, could you say something a little bit about uh, what your thoughts are uh, for not perhaps a remedy for the current merit system? This is a very interesting question and, then, and one that I think about a lot. Uh, there have been numerous international initiatives uh, trying to propose 
ways to think about this, but there are very few worked out examples of uh, how exactly we could go about it instead. But in my own field in medicine, it's very much the case that journal prestige matters. If you have a first author publication in a journal with a very high impact factor, that can make your career. Uh, conversely, if you don't, um, if you don't have enough high impact publications or high prestige publications, it, it may break it. The author order is very important. It's best to be first author or last author, but it can be very difficult to disentangle who exactly did what just by looking at an author list. Also, the journal prestige becomes a proxy measure for both quality and impact, uh, which, which has been very much criticized. And I think many people agree that it's a poor proxy measure. It is more difficult to say uh, what would be better to have instead. I would favor uh, looking more closely at uh, examples. I mean, we need, we need a pluralistic testing of different models. That's what I think with follow-up in different countries, in different settings, in different uh, research fields and domains. Uh, examples could include having a quality review of papers. So again, with a medical example, Something that is very common in clinical medicine is to do systematic reviews and to rate the risk of bias and the research quality of papers investigating a certain topic. Now, I think that kind of review is uh, more valuable in that it is more transparent and more systematic than the traditional peer review. Could we do something like that to assess quality of published outputs instead of relying on proxy measures such as the journal venue? Uh, could we diversify the range of outputs that are counted? I already mentioned uh, mentioned this. Um, I don't have all the answers, uh, but I believe more work is needed to develop models that can that can help us move from uh, from a poor proxy measure to uh, other measures that uh, that I think uh, we can strongly expect. I think we can strongly expect to find better measures than the one we have today. Let me jump in, jump in here real quick. Um, it's, a, it's also a, a short-term, a short-term, long-term thing. In the short term, uh, it's the uh, prestige of the journal uh, in my field as well as your field, uh, uh, Gustav. But that falls away really quickly and it moves to a uh, number of citations. And the reason that prestige journals uh, are prestigious is that uh, they're gonna, the visit, their visibility allows for uh, other researchers to see and then cite that work. And so if you look at, the, you know, at, the, at my CV, they're the prestigious, prestigious journals, but at the end, my impact is based on uh, the number of citations. So, the, so if we look at a more long-term view, and our impact is based on quality and the only quality measure we really have is the fact that other, pe other peers believe that your work is good. The question is then, how do we, how do we move to a more, uh, I mean, how does open, openness impact um, uh, citation? And I think that, uh, that it impacts it greatly uh, because if, um, if a, you know, Paolo's doctoral student uh, can read these journals, uh, can read these articles, they're more likely to get cited. And if he can afford them because the, he has access to them because they're free, then that is going to potentially uh, have a significant impact on the number of citations, assuming the work is good. Uh, so, so then we can kind of talk about, okay, what's the best system in order to, um, get good work out. I Can I jump in there because- Yes, Paula, please. Yeah, no, thank you, Terence, for bringing out that point because I think that's also one of the advantages of open access publication is that you will actually end up with more citations because your, your material, if it's any good, because your material is available to many more people. And, and I think the whole publication, I'm, I'm all in favor of publication and it, it's not just a big question. I mean, yes, I see the prestigious journals um, kind of phenomena as, as problematic uh, in that it, it becomes a form of dominance within publication, but academic publications have, have this, the peer review process 
it's a, I mean, it's, it's a very serious process that all, all publications go through. So in order to even be published, you have to do due diligence. And, you know, you have the peer reviewers and the editors who make sure that you do your due diligence. It's never foolproof, but at least there is that quality assurance in place there, which I don't think, which I, which is also why I like open access publications because they follow the same rigorous process. The only difference is that then the final result is more available to anyone. Thank but citations, you. absolutely. And uh, I remember years ago, one of the first anthropologists to put a monograph fully online he was writing about free and open source software, so it made sense to put the whole monograph online. Uh, that that got spread really, really wide, really widely. Thank you, Paula. Uh, talking about possible open citation advantages. Uh, comments, more comments on this matter. If not, then as a last question, uh, I would like to move from uh, a why question to a how question. We have been talking about uh, open access publishing. And in these publishing practices, there have been many ways on what are the best tools to make scientific information open available. We talk of different roads or ways to publish open access, such as green, gold, diamond publishing, and so on. It is a fact that we see a transformation of the scientific publishing practices. And what are the most important roads or ways to implement and improve open access publishing or open science as you see it? And this time I would like Terence, followed by Paula, followed by Gustav, to be the order of response. Terence, mm, please. Yeah. Um... I have with me right here a, a definition of gold and green and bronze uh, open access. So it was a green, gold, diamond, black uh, open access uh, publishing. And um, I have, uh, I'm a professor and I have uh, two PhDs and I can't understand it. Uh, the difference between uh, gold and bronze and platinum and diamond and black and, and, and whatnot. Uh, and uh, they're overlapping and they're not mutually exclusive and blah, 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 blah. So one way to go forward is to be, have some clarity in what these things mean. I think that, uh, that more researchers might be open to having their, uh, their research out there if they really understood what it meant to be platinum, gold, black, bronze, whatever color you want to, lilac, whatever color you want to, want, to, want to pick. So that's one thing I think that we need to do. Also, one thing that Paula said is in terms of the, the rigorousness of the review process. So, so in my journal, I, I know the rigor, the, how rigorous the, the process is. But every day I get about 10 emails from journals that are open access journals that, uh, that uh, saw an article that I published and say, hey, we, we said us something like this and we'll publish it. You'll be published in 10 days. We're open access. We have all this. Knowledge. And these predatory journals are, um, are muddying the waters because there are some very good and high quality uh, open access journals, but it's very difficult for the average researcher to distinguish between a high quality open access journal and the 10 uh, that I get uh, every day. So one is coming up with some clarity with what it means. Two is coming up with a way in which to uh, distinguish uh, uh, quality open access journals and predatory uh, journals. I think that those two things would be helpful in, uh, in trying to move forward. Thank you, Terence. Paula, please. Again, thanks for bringing that up because I get such emails too. And there is this like data mining going on by, by journals that are just popping up and taking advantage of the web for, you know, okay, there's a researcher who wrote about this. Let's get them in here. And I think that that is very, very important. 
to to make sure and some kind of quality standards. I don't know how that would, could be working out. Sorry, Gustav, we're building another infrastructure here <laughs> related to open access publication. Uh, but but I, th I think that is critical because otherwise open access will kind of lose its appeal and also lose lose the benefits it can certainly bring here. I'm talking about when I talk about publishing, I'm talking about serious publications that then open up the results at that level. Uh, I think, but I think another apart from I don't even I didn't even try Terence to understand what these different categories mean. <laughs> For me, what the concern has been with open access is the cost. If it's an open access journal, the cost is doesn't doesn't uh, you know affect me as a researcher. If it's not, then I have to find money to pay for open access publication of my particular article or or monograph. And those costs are not always covered. Now I know Swedish research funders these days they want open access and they accept that you add also part of your budget to open access fees that you as a, as the writer have to pay. But it's not always the case. So how how is that cost taken care of? And how is and then I'm imagining like scholars at University of Dar es Salaam, if they're supposed to find two thousand dollars to pay for open access of an article they're publishing in a journal, how is that going to happen? So that those you know the the financial structures need to be put in place. And I know Stockholm University Library, for instance, has agreements with certain journals. So that if you publish in those journals, they have agreements with you, it's open access, kind of free. Well, it's paid for somewhere else. But but I think the whole the, the whole costing the pay how how it's paid for has to be sorted out better. Thank you, Paula. Gustav, comments? Yes, uh, scientific publishing is very expensive. Uh, in Sweden, in total. The universities and libraries pay something like 500 million crowns per year. This is comparable to the budget of an entire research council that we could uh, have spent the money on instead. Uh, the subscription costs have been going up steadily for several decades. Uh, the publishers have raised the costs and because the journals are not substitutable because they have unique content. It's a kind of monopolistic competition. So the libraries have been forced to keep uh, subscribing. And the open access journals are, of course, partly a response to this, uh, this problem. How can, we, how can we make the research open and cut the costs? And it was hoped that the open access journals where the authors pay a fee upfront would lead to cost savings. Now, it doesn't seem to be the case. The open access fees are, in many cases, incredibly high. It, they can be uh, 2,000 euros, 4,000 euros, even higher in, in certain journals. And it also leads to a kind of double dipping where we, uh, for some journals that have a hybrid model, pay both in advance and for the subscription. And uh, as many of you uh, are aware, and as Paula alluded to, uh, the response from from universities and libraries have been to try to negotiate deals uh, where uh, where we buy as it were for sweden a certain uh, number of prepaid articles uh, that researchers can submit uh, and that's uh, uh, that means that for the researchers uh, there are no um no author facing charges as they are sometimes called uh, we can go to our university library and ask them to pay for the open access fee. But that's uh, not going to last uh, forever. In a few years, we need to make new deals with the publishers. And uh, by that time, uh, th the research community would benefit from having an idea of what we would like to see. Uh, now, personally, I'm a great fan of publishing my work uh, in uh, preprint repositories. I like to take my manuscript once it is finished and put it out there. Uh, and uh, this, in my experience, leads to uh, higher visibility and uh, I often get valuable comments. Um, also, in some sense, it's, um, uh, it's weird to have a publication as a kind of uh, break on the whole research front uh, with, uh, with a lag of several months and sometimes years before 
uh, from when a, a scholarly output is is finished by the researcher to when someone else can read it. Um, now, uh, uh, quality control is very important. Uh, I uh, I agree with Paula about that as well. Uh, if you go around and talk to researchers, you will find many anecdotes about peer review. Often it is rigorous, sometimes it is not. And I would love to see more transparent models for quality control. Thank you, Gustav. Interesting thoughts. Any immediate comments from the other panelists? If not, uh, I want perhaps we should move on to, we have time for probably only one question from uh, the audience at the moment. And there's a question in the Q&A, which returns to the theme of the open access week. It matters how we open knowledge, building structural equity. And paraphrasing uh, the question, how does this uh, rhyme with equity? the fact that there are also expensive article processing charge and asking the panelists who sh shall pay for the openness in less rich countries or who will, who can pay for it. Well, I mean, if, if we're, if uh, the more well-off, let's say countries are uh, helping to build infrastructure in countries, uh, helping to, to build uh, uh, education uh, and to democratize education in those countries, then uh, uh, allowing them to have access to research is, uh, is key to that. So whoever is going to be paying for the development in those countries should pay for those things. Uh, uh, absolutely, until the, uh, the country uh, themselves can uh, can can readily afford it. I mean, of, of course, if they can't pay for it, someone has to pay for it. And if we want them to develop, uh, this is the this is, education is the fastest way to do it. And this is a, a way that we can uh, rapidly speed up the day where they can be uh, self sufficient. Thank you, uh, Gustav. I think you want to respond. Yes, this question highlights that the APC model, where the author pays. Uh, is not uh, sustainable as the only solution. Uh, we have uh, publication platforms that offer pretty much the same functionality except the peer review at a very small fraction of the cost. And I believe infrastructures of that sort uh, are the way forward. Thank you, Gustav. Uh, I, 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 agree with, I, I agree with Gustav. I think it's, it's like opening up and, and making sure that there are, there are access is given to scholars, not just some kind of like, you know, benevolent assistance, but to actually rethink the structure. Thank you, Paula. I see that there are some unanswered uh, questions in the chat. Uh, we will say them and try to get uh, you uh, answers uh, to them some other time, I'm afraid. Uh, although uh, I could perhaps say that one question was, uh, what can libraries do in order to promote open science? And then I would like to close this panel discussion by saying, answering that question myself, that to host these kind of discussions uh, between different researchers is an excellent way of at least starting a conversation about, about a very pressing problem in the scientific community today. And I would like to thank uh, you all panelists for this valuable discussion. And I thank you all to all participants in this Stockholm Trio Library hosted session. Have a nice afternoon. <laughs>